Imagine being able to travel and see the world for free. The two biggest expenses when it comes to travel are paying for flights and figuring out where to stay. When staying with friends or family for at least a night, you usually get a free room or couch to sleep on. You just need to cover the flight. But what if you don't have any friends in a particular country you wanted to visit? Well, that's where couch surfing comes in. Before Airbnb came along, this was one of the only options for lodging if you didn't want to get an expensive hotel. Established in 2004, Couchsurfing allowed users on the site to request homestays and connect with users in different countries before traveling. Kind of like Tinder, but for travel instead of hooking up. Over the years, the company has gone through so many changes, some being completely detrimental to its brand. What actually happened to Couchsurfing? And could you learn from their mistakes? In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into the rise and fall of Couchsurfing. Let's start at the beginning. As mentioned earlier, the company got its start in the early 2000s, created and developed by a computer programmer named Casey Fenton. Growing up in a small town, Casey didn't really know much about the world. At the age of 19, Casey booked a flight to Egypt with a group that was trying to revive tourism after a recent local tragedy. While there, he was guided by a local around the desert and in an interview, recalls climbing pyramids in the moonlight and peeking into a pharaoh's tomb. He instantly fell in love with traveling and meeting locals and was already looking for his next adventure. In 1999, he found a decently priced flight from Boston to Iceland, but didn't have anywhere to stay. So what did he do? Well, as any computer programmer would do, he hacked into the database of the University of Iceland and sent an email to 1,500 random students asking for a place to crash. To his surprise, he got back over 100 replies and ultimately chose to stay with an Icelandic R&B singer where he ended up having an amazing time singing and dancing around the capital with her and her friends. On his flight back home reflecting on how much fun he had, he thought of how he could replicate this experience for himself and others and thought Couchsurfing would be a pretty good idea for a company. So he purchased the domain name Couchsurfing.com in June of 1999. For a few years, not much happened. Then in 2003, Couchsurfing International Inc. was formed. It was created as a nonprofit with plans to eventually apply for tax exemption. A year later in 2004, the website was finally launched thanks to the help of Dan Hoffer, Sebastian Lituan, and Leonardo Silvera who all serve as the founders. From 2006 all the way up to 2011, the site was worked on by volunteers. That's right, unlike most companies or startups you hear about today, Couchsurfing.com was mostly developed and worked on during events that they called Couchsurfing Collectives. These were events where volunteers would meet to work on the website collaboratively, and this took place all over the world. Regardless of all the work that these volunteers put in, however, the website was full of software glitches and crashes happened frequently. In June of 2006, the site's hard drive crashed along with all of their backups, deleting a large part of their site's database, causing the website to be lost entirely. After this incident, Casey started posting online asking for help with the site. One of the couchsurfing collectives that was already taking place in Montreal during this time raised $8,000 in donations to restart the website. They started to take the website a lot more seriously after this reboot, and they continued to scale up until they finally hit a million users in 2009. But as the site was blowing up, so were the problems behind the scenes. In November of 2007, the company applied for 501c3 tax status as a nonprofit organization and had been working toward this for years. This tax-exempt status was ultimately rejected in 2011. What did this mean for the company? Well, after being denied, they were faced with a new reality. They had to switch to a for-profit company fast and had to gather assets to acquire the original nonprofit, which added up to about a million dollars. But they didn't have any money. Enter the world of venture capital. In 2011, they created a private C corporation under the same name as before, Couchsurfing International Inc. They met with investors and basically pitched the same idea as Airbnb and were able to raise $7.6 million. They then acquired the assets of the nonprofit company and dissolved it at the end of the year. The members of the nonprofit team objected to the company's transition to for profit. It was originally promised that there would never be a cost for the service, ever, a rule that they were now breaking. They continued on and received an additional $15 million in funding in 2012 from their previous investors as well as new ones. This investment brings their total funding to over $22 million. With this new funding, they were able to create mobile apps for iOS and Android that same year. The next few years, the company would undergo a lot of internal changes, taking a turn for the worst. The role of CEO was somewhat unstable within the next chapter of business. From April 2012 to October 2013, Tony Espinoza, the former vice president and general manager of MTV Social Network Games, was the CEO. Tony's first order of business was to drive an aggressive advertising campaign. The campaign worked and membership for the app doubled. 
However, Tony's new users were a lot more interested in surfing and very few were interested in actually hosting. Members were also concerned with Couchsurfing's terms of service that they believed would allow the company to sell their data to third parties. Back at the office, Tensions began to rise between Tony and the former CEO and founder Casey Fenton. Casey was a big fan of Burning Man. While he was a CEO, the entire team had always been free to take work off and head to the desert during this event. This year with a new CEO, Tony was furious and did not approve of the same tradition. Casey was laid off soon after and Tony continued to fire more and more people, totaling 40% of their staff. Tony's reign of terror ended in 2013 and he was replaced by Jennifer Billock, who was head of product marketing. The ripples of his destruction weren't over though. More on this later. Over the years, Couchsurfing went through a lot of changes and this showed from the feedback from its users. The changes in management and the move from non-profit to for-profit led to its user base declining. But why? For one, the original users didn't believe in paying for the app service. They didn't feel the need to pay, especially when they used to get the same thing for free. This led to many users deleting the app. With social media on the rise at the same time, users who didn't want to pay for the service simply went to Twitter or Facebook. Another big reason was most people who found the service useful wouldn't need to use it often enough to warrant paying for it. Think about how often you travel. Would you want to pay for a monthly fee for something you're only going to use about once or twice a year? Airbnb was also available and gaining traction at this time, meaning if users would have to pay for a lodging service anyway, with Airbnb they would have the option to choose somewhere potentially a lot nicer. With that being said, there were plenty of users who frequently traveled and or stayed loyal to the app even though they had to pay. But still, the decline in the users was undeniable and it was becoming a real problem. Here's a few more potentially contributing factors. During the time the company was transitioning to a more traditional company, it fell under some controversy among its own staff for the lack of women in leadership positions. Some say, there was definitely the feeling that women were the assistants and that there was no path to leadership for women in couchsurfing. A remote team member back in 2009 when they had volunteers sent out a resignation letter stating, I cannot continue to volunteer for couchsurfing because I cannot volunteer under a team leader and or member of the leadership team who has committed and admitted two cases of sexual harassment. This was an explosive statement, and the team member in question resigned soon after as a result of this. Within the same summer, another incident occurred in Britain. A man was sentenced to 10 years in prison for the sexual assault of a female tourist he met through couchsurfing. Fast forward to the future after Tony Espinosa's aggressive advertising doubled their user base, this naturally came more sleazy guys to the platform, and many stories of sexual assaults continue to surface to this day. The fall of couchsurfing was long and hard. After Jennifer Billock became CEO, the damage was already done and the morale was at an all-time low. The idea for couchsurfing started with great intentions, but over time turned sour due to issues of taxes, profit, sex, and discrimination. If anything, this is a tale that we can all take some lessons from. As far as travel goes, will we ever be able to once again travel freely with strangers turned friends? No one knows for sure. That's it for this video guys, thank you so much for watching and let us know what you 